Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast, bringing you expert insights into how social media is changing the political game. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, Assistant Professor of Communication and Media at Lund University. Remember, you can follow the show on Twitter at SMNP Podcast or visit us on the web at socialmediaandpolitics.org. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in. Got a really interesting episode lined up for you today. My guest is Baroness Biben Kidron. She is a filmmaker and chair of the Five Rights Foundation. And recently, on June 23rd, they launched an awareness campaign entitled Twisted Toys, which aims to highlight the practices of tech companies that can lead to the commercial exploitation of children. So Five Rights is an advocacy organization that focuses on things like children-centered design, their rights in a digital world, and crucially, children's data protection. So we're going to get into that, but in particular, we're going to focus on this Twisted Toys campaign, which is just brilliant. And I want to share a couple clips from that campaign. And basically what it is, is developing toys and shooting kind of children's commercials, like you might think of selling a Barbie doll or Hot Wheels toy. And the toys are designed to mimic these tech company practices that can lead to commercial exploitation. So probably the best performer from this campaign is Share Bear, a cuddly teddy bear with a camera for an eye that collects data on children and sells that data for profit. So here's a clip from the Share Bear commercial. Twisted Toys presents Share Bear, the bear that learns everything about you, then sells the data for profit. <laughs> I'm just a teddy bear. Share Bear has all the features you need in a cuddly best friend. Location tracking, conversation monitoring, remote activated camera. I'm watching you. He makes predictions about your life. You look sad today. Here's an advert about losing weight. But remember, he's not keeping your secrets. They're sold straight to billion dollar tech companies instead. Awesome! Sweet dreams, I'll be tracking you. Caution, ShareBear uses poor data practices. Your privacy will be violated. You'll be relentlessly sold to. Companies will exploit children with impunity. Keep away from fire. So that's the cuddly share bear, and each commercial ends with the lines, we do not accept this anywhere else, we must not accept it online. So you can visit twisted-toys.com, there'll be a link to it in the episode description to check out these commercials. Uh, I'm just going to play a couple more clips here to give you an idea of these uh, products and the practices that they're highlighting. So the next one is the stalky talky, which highlights how algorithms can connect children to strangers online. And so here's a clip from that one. Bringing the online world to life, it's Twisted Toys. Calling all you kids, Stalky Talky has arrived. It's the toy that uses algorithms to connect children with adult strangers. Just squeeze the button and see if anyone wants to say hello. Where do you live? A new best friend. Would you like to make some extra money? So popular. Why don't you change into your swimwear? Totally cool. <laughs> So that is the stalky talky, potentially getting an endorsement from Chris Hansen. We'll see. Um, but the last one I want to play for you is my favorite. It's called My First Terms and Conditions, which is just a massive book <laughs> highlighting how kids cannot read these terms and conditions. So let's just hear a uh, the, the front and back end of that one. The writing's really small, but you've got to read it all. It's my first terms and conditions. Deliberately unfair, you'll be pulling out your hair. Cool. Nobody reads the terms and conditions. Caution: The university graduate reading level is required to understand the text in this book. Legal representation may be required. It weighs about thirty pounds. Ah, uh, yes, I remember my first terms and conditions like it was yesterday. So you get the idea behind the commercials, and again, definitely recommend checking out twisted-toys.com, where you can watch them and also see toys that don't have commercials, but have these kind of prototypes where you can see the practices that they're highlighting, things like uh, fishing for likes on social media. Um, so in this episode, B-Ben is going to tell us about the motivations behind the campaign, uh, the reception it's had so far, and her practical experience dealing with legislators and advocating for change on these children's digital rights issues. And I know listeners of this podcast are either working in the advocacy space or are trying to engage policymakers in reform around social media data access for research, for example. And so I think it's interesting to hear about B-Ben's experiences in enacting legislative change and how 
change in one regulatory environment like the UK can spill over into other contexts as well. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Baroness Biban Kidron. Again, she is the chair of the Five Rights Foundation. Baroness Kidron, thanks so much for taking the time out and welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Great to be with you. So to start out here, could you give us an introduction into Five Rights and what motivated you to get involved in campaigning for children's digital rights in the first place? So for the first 30 odd years of my life, I was actually a filmmaker. And every time I made a movie, you know, the sort of cinema uh, film, I used to go off and make a documentary in between on a social issue. And in 2012, I made a documentary. It was called In Real Life. And it was looking at teenagers and the internet. And I had no idea that making that documentary would totally transform my life and, in fact, ruin my career. (laughs) So, you know, all the people who we normally credit with uh, setting up the Internet, they all kept on saying this thing, which is, you know, all users will be equal, as if that was a, a uniformly good thing. But actually, if you treat all users as equal, you actually treat a child as if they're an adult. And I had spent hundreds of hours in the bedrooms of children, you know, falling in love, watching porn, gaming, whatever it is they were doing, I was filming. And I realized that so many of the issues that they faced were really because they were being treated as adult. They were being asked to make adult discriminations, understand things that they did not have the capacity for. And and I just thought that is an injustice. So five rights were set up and, and we really look at the system. I think that's what's unique about five rights. We're there to build a digital world that children deserve. We want kids using digital products and we are not tech detractors. We're tech evangelists. We just say, hang on a minute. It has to learn to include children on a basis uh, that's good for them. And we do three things, really. Uh, Data protection and privacy, child-centered design. That is, how would you make products if you imagined that the end user was a child? And uh, upholding children's rights in the digital world. And we have made huge advances in each of those areas. Yeah, it's really interesting, this idea of yeah the internet being kind of equal and open for all, but there is a difference there between uh, adults and children. And before we dive into the Twisted Toys campaign, I'd like to ask you first about some of your prior advocacy experience, particularly around the age-appropriate design code. So you successfully introduced this amendment to the UK's 2018 Data Protection Act, which sets protection standards for children by making online services age-appropriate. And I'm curious to get your take on how responsive policymakers are to these types of initiatives, because I mean, protecting children's rights online shouldn't really be a partisan issue. So what are the key challenges you face when advocating for children's digital rights? Is it just getting policymakers to prioritize them or are there other obstacles involved in getting legislation changed? Yeah, that's a really great question, actually. I mean, the truth is, you know, when I first did it and I was trying to imagine what good looked like, it was really the absence of of any footsteps in the snow. I think that's really the truth of it, is that if you look at uh, legislation and regulation, it sort of follows in a pattern of previous decisions and you sort of build on it. And here we were in this new world order where we had a sector albeit a sector that's responsible for the wealth of 25% of money changing hands in the world, but you know, nonetheless, a sector that had claimed exceptionalism. And I was kind of going, okay, if you were a child and you needed data protection, what would that look like? And so I think the key things about that piece of legislation that have really transformed the conversation internationally and indeed regulation on the books is that I went to the Convention on the Rights of the Child and said the definition of a child is someone under the age of 18 not 13, as uh, Copper would have it. So, you know, in the rest of life, we don't think that 13-year-olds are adult and chuck them out of the house and expect them to get on with it. So that was it. The other thing is that most law pertaining to children online was to do with uh, spaces that were directed at children. But most children spend most of the time in spaces that are not directed at them. So now the protections of the code go with the child. So there's this new concept in law likely to be accessed, a service 
likely to be accessed by a child. And that means a service that the child is likely to want to access, uh, but also services that access children without their knowledge. And that's an important point too. And the third and, and final piece really was uh, about saying that all of the protections, and there are 15 detailed protections within the law, are by design and default. And what that means is, instead of having complex things that you can possibly do if you spend a lot of time doing it and clicking through and understanding, that actually all the protections of the code had to be given to children by the service and sort of take away the responsibility of the child. Now, it does allow a child to change things, but the default setting has to be high by default. And those three things have transformed how we now talk about it. And just very briefly to your other point, I mean, we're seeing copycat of the code and mirrors of the code and, and even enhancements to the code happening all over the world now because it's described a path. But we're also seeing things like age appropriate, likely to be accessed, uh, citing children's uh, rights and so on in lots and lots of other legislation uh, from conversations uh, with the African Union around cybersecurity to the EU's AI regulation to our own online safety bill. So this language is what I think my contribution was, was actually just imagining a new world order, imagining a new picture with children at the center. Right. And then getting those, you know, key changes uh, to the law around those, um, you know, particular nuances of language, I think is, is, I mean, that's the goal of advocacy campaigns, right? Um, I want to come back to some of those issues around legislation, but let's get into Twisted Toys. I love this campaign. What are its main goals and what was the idea behind making the campaign satirical? Yeah. So as you can imagine, I start my life off as a filmmaker and then I go into this sort of bizarre area of data protection, you know, and I cannot tell you over the last eight years how many times people have sort of glazed over as I try to explain systemic changes <laughs> to technical systems and automated decision making. And, and, and I actually got to the point, you know, I mean, I am a communicator. I was trained in film and, and I just kind of got to the point where I I thought, you know, there must be a better way of telling this story. And I sat down with a bunch of really fabulous designers and, and, and thinkers and, and communicators. And I said, OK, here is the essay question. It is, how do you say what I am about to tell you in 20 minutes in less than 60 seconds? How do you do that? And I gave them my whole shtick about data protection. I gave my whole shtick about child-centered design, about the importance of children's rights. I explained some of the things that are egregious that we see in everyday interactions with digital that people don't understand. And over a period of 10 and a half months, we came up uh, with this campaign, Twisted Toys. And the satirical thing is, you know, it kind of comes back to my first point. It's really easy to say, hey, you, you're a middle-aged woman, you don't understand, or hey, you, you've got a critique, therefore you don't like tech. You know, that kind of lazy intellectual go-to attacks have been happening to me for years. But actually, if you kind of joyously go, look, here it is. This is what it looks like if you take it out of the context where we've been cheated to believe this is normal. Yeah, you make your mind up. And what really happens, and I've obviously I've had this experience over the last few weeks of playing them in real time to people all over the world. And it's just a joy watching people's face because they start laughing and then they get cross. And then there's a sort of a brilliant moment where it descends. And, and, and at the end of the video, uh, it says, you know, we do not accept this anywhere else. We must not accept it online. And honestly, I could run my whole campaign if I had a dollar for every time someone says, too right. You know, I mean, like literally people are mad as hell. And and so I think that that's a very joyous thing for us, that people have got the campaign, have understood the campaign. And a lot of them have really said it was tremendously helpful in articulating something that they felt some anxiety about, but they didn't know how to say 
why it was wrong. And particularly, I think, Share Bear, in a way, has been the most successful of the videos. And I think that the uh, Stalky Talky has been the most confronting. Uh, and just just because I think it would interest your audience, we did some polling in the UK the week we launched. And uh, I think it was 57% of parents had no idea that strange adults could be recommended as friends to children online, 57%, and 86% thought it shouldn't be allowed. Yeah, but but what an extraordinary situation we find ourselves in where something that is so routine, because I think 75% of the things kids use have that functionality, is not only not understood, but actually people have a really clear view on it, and yet it's not even in the conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's such a powerful way to to compress these messages. I mean, the videos are so well shot. It's like, you know, it reminds me of watching commercials for, you know, Power Rangers toys back in the day or whatever it was. And I'm curious to hear more about the actual design process. How did you decide on what tech practices you wanted to highlight and then actually come up with the toys to illustrate them? So, so that's a really interesting point. I mean, we, we thought about different things, you know, and we had some ideas that we rejected, uh, I think, including we, we had one idea, which was uh, giving away free ice creams on an ice cream truck all over the world and then making people sign away their firstborn child as a, you know, in, in exchange for it and so on. So we had loads of ideas before we settled on the, on the toys. But I think that what we what we liked about the idea of toys is traditional toys are something that you give to a child. So there we've got the first piece of it. And then the second thing is there's actually a very highly uh, sophisticated system of regulation around production of toys. So one of the things that was hilarious was that I was asked by a TV station to let the host have Share Bear on her lap. And I could only do that if she she signed a waiver because it's not made <laughs> to the level if, if it was actually a bear and actually for sale. And the reason that I make that point is that then when you go to this satirical level and you go, now we're going to put in all the norms. I mean, absolute norms. There is nothing in any of the toys that is particularly radical. It's all the things that we as Five Rights campaign on, you know, in general. Yeah. And say, if we had risk assessments, if we had child-centered design, if we had privacy, none of these things would be there just zero. And actually, in a really important point for your audience, almost all of them do not require the invention of anything. They actually just have to withhold some bad practice. Yeah. So I think it's really important to to say that what we were doing was really trying to capture the norms. And so Sherba is really about data protection. Uh, Stalky Talky is about automated friend introductions of various kinds. Uh, One of my favorite toys is the yo-yo, which is about micropayments. You know, pay as you yo-yo, it's called. And the other one that I particularly like um, is the pocket troll, you know, that that sort of throws out homophobic, racist, misogynist stuff that is never taken away. Uh, But don't worry. Don't worry, the toy says. It comes with a pack of uh, community rules, but we never enforce them. And again, you know, you recognize that immediately when you see it in that form. So our process, and it was very carefully done, and we went backwards and forwards about the language and trying to make it sort of uh, provocative without being upsetting for parents or children who may come across the videos. Mm. Yeah, I, I have to say, I think my, my favorites are, uh, I think my absolute favorite is uh, my first Terms and Conditions. <laughs> I love that video <laughs> we've played for the, the audience in the introduction. And also the Fishing for Likes, which is kind of a hungry, hungry hippos of getting as many reactions as you can get. Oh, great. <laughs> so, I mean, clearly a lot of work has been put into, you know, designing the campaign's concept, creating the actual toys, shooting the videos, et cetera. So what was the kind of dissemination plan behind launching the campaign and maximizing its reach? I saw that U.S. Congresswoman Lori Trahan praised the campaign in a statement. So how do you make sure that the campaign's message gets in front of the right audience? And what's the role of social media there as opposed to, say, traditional mainstream media? 
So um, I think it's probably worth saying to your audience, we're a tiny, tiny organization. We have 11 employees. So, you know, doing a global campaign is something of a stretch, yeah? And the plan really was to to get a, a few key players in the media to sort of draw attention to it, but also then to network through the people who really are, you know, fellow travelers on this issue. And what I mean by that is, I mean, the data privacy people, I mean, the alternative uh, Facebook oversight board, I mean, common sense, I mean, you know, the children's charities here. And then there's a lot of politicians. And we had a very similar call out right across Europe from MEPs and, and from both sides of the of the political divide here in the UK. And you actually mentioned this earlier about it. It's a nonpartisan issue. It really is. I'll tell you how it divides between the people who understand it and the people who don't. Once you understand it, you're on side. If you don't understand it, you think you could educate kids for this world, or you could think there's nothing that can be done, the horse is bolted, or, you know, you don't understand this is a wholly designed world, wholly designed to optimize for certain things. And, you know, I would argue, and I do argue, that you actually have to optimize for commercial things after you've taken care of your child users, not before. Yeah. So all those arguments, which is what the campaign is there to to raise. Now, actually, the campaign has been a huge success and we're going to do a round two, probably in September. We've had a lot of reach out from people saying, how can we help? We love it. We're going to spread it and so on. And to your point, which I, I am guessing is sort of is the irony social media spreads the message against social media. Um, I think, you know, we have to be really careful about this and say, look, you know, we're not against social media or indeed any other media. We're not against digital technologies. What we are, it's about uses and abuses. And there's a lot of good that has come through uh, campaigning on social media. And we hope that people who do speak in that way you know, will speak to the importance of this. And, and we've been very gratified by some of the people who've reached out. And, and I think that the, the next time we go out, we, it will be even bigger. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to round two of these, of these toys or whatever uh, form it ends up taking. So you mentioned the campaign um, was a big success. And so it launched on June 23rd. I'm curious to get your take on, you know, what are those kind of criteria for measuring success? So actually, I have to say, as an organization, we only have one criteria, which is if the lived experience of children is better after we do what we do, that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for awareness except as a pressure for change. And we're not looking for legislation in itself. We want to see whether it's effective in what it delivers and so on and so forth. So I think I should make that really, really clear. So the exact win, if you like, of this campaign will not be evident to us for a few months yet, because it, it'll depend on, you know, on what happens as a result. If I say that the step it made was it brought some new people into the fold who actually, if you like, got it. Yeah. They suddenly looked at it and said, thank you, I didn't understand, I got it. And that will be very, very important, particularly amongst the policy community and, and politicians around the world. It will not have passed you by that we have quite a lot of legislation here in uh, the UK. There are reams of things coming through the EU with relevance to this agenda. And actually, you know, we've had uh, some interesting things happening in Congress and a few more on their way, as I understand it. And equally, you know, just to keep the scale of the issue, you know, we're seeing Canada, Australia, African Union, you know, we are seeing all sorts of people inching towards having some new norms for children. And things like this help people, help politicians articulate the importance, but also it helps them understand the three-pronged attack. 
We have to have data protection for children. You know, if the business model is data, then the answer to protection lies in data protection. Yeah, period. We have to imagine children as users. And actually, one thing I haven't really mentioned sort of fully is that one of the things that we did as an organization, we were very proud to be the consultants to the Council on the Rights of the Child who hold the convention, which in most nations sets the bar for domestic treatment of children. And we wrote something called the General Comment 25 with uh, experts and consultation all over the world, including with a thousand children in 28 countries. (laughs) And uh, General Comment 25, which anyone can find on our website, um, has been adopted. And it is the official document that lays out how children's rights should be applied in the digital environment. And it puts a duty on the 196 states uh, that are signatories to the convention to actually, you know, enact what is in general comment. So I think what I'm trying to say is this is a global movement. It's inching. But what we're inching towards is a consensus of what a child is, when they need protection, how we best protect them, and some really practical sort of outlines of what that looks like. And Twisted Toys may seem very, very far from all of that, but actually for the fact that I'm speaking to you and for the fact that all these all these politicians said thank you and for phase two when you see it, uh, I can assure you it's been it's been a tremendous sort of leap in understanding for people. Yeah. And following up on that point, um, I mean, the Twisted Toys campaign is I think it explicitly mentions on the website that it's a you know awareness raising campaign. Um, so it doesn't have call to actions that are you know funneling people towards a petition or something like that. And so, I mean, you, you kind of uh, alluded to this already, but how do you see the role of awareness campaigns in the context of other advocacy initiatives like petitions or lobbying politicians directly, which you know have a more actionable, concrete outcome, but don't have that wider public outreach? You know, it's a really good question, and I, I'm not sure I've got a really perfect answer. I think the one thing I feel as a as a citizen, and so I hope I behave like this as a campaigner, is, you know, I don't want to be asked to do things that aren't going to make a difference. I don't want to click on something or so on, you know, that is not going to result in something. I don't mind putting my name to things and, and I don't mind being just a tiny piece of a big voice. But I think that we felt, put it this way, I would be really thrilled with every person who hears this podcast says, has a look at the website, looks at the, the work we're doing and either joins our mailing list or indeed writes to their representative and say, do you know what, you've got to look at this. I want protections for kids, for my kids, for my neighbor's kids, for any kids, for the kids I teach or care for. I want this and I support those people around the world in Congress, in your case, you know, who are trying to bring in such protections. This should be more important in the political agenda. I would love it if people were mad as hell and wanted to do that. But I think we've got another step. And I think that the other step that we're doing, and I think we are sort of coming together as a collective community, a lot of politicians across the world are talking to each other on this basis. And what we will see over the next couple of years is data protection around the world, child-centered design, which sometimes you guys call platform accountability, things you must or must not do if you've got a child as an end user, and actually reconfiguring the image of a child as being someone under 18. That is to say, anybody under the age of 18 has the right to a childhood, has a right to the special treatment that children uh, have, and has a right for business to treat them according to their capacity. That's what we do in consumer law. That's what we do in health and safety law. That's what we do. You cannot just go, you know, to a bar and uh, buy a kid a drink. You cannot just sell them a gun or a knife. You cannot actually, even as a drug company, give them the same dose as an adult. We take care of children elsewhere. We have to take care of them in this context. 
Mm. And my, my last question for you has to do with the, the global scope of children's privacy issues in relation to you know the different regulatory environments that govern them. Because on the one hand, there are global tech companies and the issues you're campaigning for are universally applicable. But how are you approaching dealing with different sets of regulations in, say, the U.S. versus the U.K. versus the EU? Do the different regulatory environments influence how you approach advocating for change within them? Um, well, they do in, the, in a very detailed sense. So, you know, we absolutely, you know, look at the Digital Services Act, see what it's trying to do, see what it could do more, advocate for something specific in relation to that. Uh, ditto, uh, there's something else in the EU right now about uh, about connected toys, and we have some things that we'd like to see in there. So, you know, and indeed, we made an intervention on the AI regulation uh, with colleagues in the EU. So, yes, in a literal sense, the answer is we do look at uh, things in France and Australia and America and so on. I think in a more general sense, we're seeing, and I think that's really what we're working towards, we're seeing a sort of a, a more holistic approach. So I don't know whether it came to your attention, but I think it was uh, two nights ago, uh, Senator Markey and Representative Trahan and Castor wrote to the six biggest tech companies in Silicon Valley and said, you know, we notice that this uh, age appropriate design code is coming in the UK. We notice it offers protections. What are the protections that you are giving? And are you going to give them to US children as well? Yeah. And I thought that letter was really remarkable. And I was very excited to see it. Yeah. And I think that they're right. They're kind of going, hang on a minute, are American children less precious than UK children just because we got one over the line here? <laughs> you know, um, absolutely not is the answer for anyone who is wondering. Um, you know, American children are just as precious as children here on my own patch. And, and I think even more importantly, I would say, you know, 50% of the world is online, right? You know, one in three people globally online is under the age of 18. And many of the rest of the 50% as they come on will also be younger and younger because they're going to come from the global south. Now, what kind of protections do we need to offer them? Yeah. And I think that, that we do want to ask those companies that question and say, actually, we want a higher bar and we want it for all children. Hmm. As, as always with this podcast, the, the last question is never the last question. I have one more that comes to mind um, hearing you talk about these kind of upcoming uh, legislations around you know, AI. And I'm thinking particularly around the Internet of Things. So with the Twisted Toys campaign, you're, you're using toys like a metaphor for some of these data practices. But I mean, and I think this is maybe what ShareBear is highlighting, is that as toys become more digital and connected in a kind of IoT environment, then that risk to children becomes, I think, much more severe in terms of selling data and the data that are collected on children. So how is Five Rights and in your own thinking um, trying to address some of these issues when toys actually become connected and, and data collectors? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really important point. And we we are very, it's not just toys, it's smart homes, you know, it's mm. smart homes in general. And, and in fact, it comes back to the whole problem of, you know, not really designing for the youngest person in the house, uh, not really thinking about the capacity of the people using the products. And basically our position, if you like, is that the data protections in smart homes and for smart toys should be appropriate for the youngest person using them. And I think that in a, in a business that is more or less based on the concept of personalization, it is pretty ridiculous to sort of bleat or cry that this has to be put in the too difficult box. <laughs> You know, um, as as one child said to me, and I, I was in a school and I was talking to a bunch of kids and, you know, I do a lot of work with children directly because they tell me what's going on and help me understand. And, and he goes, I don't get it, miss. If they know I like red trainers, how don't they know I'm 12? <laughs> yeah. And, and that is that is the 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 million dollar question. And it's really cute, and it's just like our videos, and it's really funny, except that that child was talking about actually being offered contact with an adult, clearly pornographic content, 
and he was 12. So they were absolutely targeting him with the shoes that they knew he liked, actually with something, uh, uh, an age-appropriate advert for something to do with uh, schoolwork and also that. And you kind of go, hang on, that's not a world we should be expecting kids to routinely manage. That's a world we got to sort out. Definitely. And it's it's really interesting to hear these issues because as adults, sometimes we don't we don't think about them, even though we are the ones who make the laws. So thanks so much for taking the time out and sharing your insights with us. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. I've just been speaking with Baroness Biban Kidron, chair of the Five Rights Foundation. Remember, check out twisted-toys.com. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm going to go on a bit of a summer holiday from podcasting for the next few weeks. So uh, we'll see. Next episodes probably will start dropping in August. And I think we'll look at some more recent research that's happening on the social media and politics front. But until then, I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, signing off from Elba. See you next time.